Hello and welcome to a premium interview uh, hosted by me, Bo Dade, and I'm joined by Simon Webb, uh, who runs the channel History Debunked. How are you, Simon? I'm fine, and you? I'm good, thanks. And I uh, really appreciate your time. Uh, and uh, hopefully we can talk about some of the strange things that are happening in our society at the moment and uh, the way that the fallout in, in history, the narratives of history. Um, so uh, who better to ask than your good self? <laughs> Um, so as well as uh, your your channel, which is, you know, going great guns, you're also quite a prolific author uh, about all sorts of things. Uh, so I wondered if you'd like to say a word or two just about that. Well, I write a lot of Westerns. I have about 50 Westerns in print and I'm working on another series at the moment. But also I've got uh, 20, 25 nonfiction books on social history, military history, education and so on. So, yeah, I do, I do a lot of writing. <laughs> I think prolific is, is fair. <laughs> prolific is a reasonable term, yes. Um, uh, yes, so, I mean, where, where you know all about sort of the world of publishing, really, then um, some of the things that, that go on in the world of history uh, publishing, um, you know, you're not a complete novice to, so you can see things. Like some of one of your videos in fa fairly recent was that chap who uh, wanted to go into a weather Weatherstones and... Uh, uh, sign some of his books you know that that story <laughs> and uh, you said well actually I have published plenty of books myself and that is crazy um, uh, so yeah I wonder what what you've thought over the years uh, because obviously it, it's, it seems that things are getting worse we, you know we, we're on a, a downward trajectory in terms of sort of the untruthfulness of, of non-fiction history books and things just in your lived experience, that's a horrible term to use, but do, do you think it really is getting a lot worse, especially in the last 10 or 15 years? Or is that is that perspective already skewed? What's your feelings on that? It's certainly changed. But, of course, I'm probably the wrong person to ask because old people always think that things are worse than they <laughs> were 50 years ago. So... It's difficult for me. I can't be objective because I'm embedded in history. I can't stand outside history and look at it as though I'm a supernatural being. So, yes, it, my perspective is that there's been deterioration and decline. But then we remember the words of the hymn, change and decay all around I see. And it's how old people view the world. <laughs> that is an interesting thing. I, 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 it often springs to mind that in uh, the Iliad, old man Nestor talks about how things were better in his day when he was a young man, when men were stronger and more virtuous <laughs> in one That's generation ago. Right, yes. And in um, the scripture as well, Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament says, don't ask why things were so much better in the old days. It's not an intelligent question. <laughs> and that was written 3,000 years ago. <laughs> it's human nature. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. I think you're absolutely right. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you about is, is your sort of... Um, uh, your sort of tone and style of delivery. Um, it's uh, obviously it's very it's a very sort of mellow tone uh, when in fact you're talking about you know extremely serious things. You know civilizational potentially civilizational ending topics, uh, massive sweeping things to do with history. Sometimes, like, as I say, quite dark, um, but always with that sort of uh, you know almost jolly tone I, I guess that must be deliberate is that just how you are always or uh, it, was that a deliberate sort of you know um, editorial decision to, no, to be like no that? It, it it's not an affectation it's simply that there's nothing I can do to change those things it's pointless getting worked up and shouting and foaming at the mouth about things that I can't affect that that would simply make me feel bad and it wouldn't make anything better mm -hmm. So, so as you reach a certain age, you realise that there are some things which are going to happen regardless of what you say and do. Mm. Okay, yeah, no, fair enough, fair enough. Um, so jumping into some of your, because a lot of your videos are sort of uh, around the topics of, you know, here's where history has been warped or, yeah. or here's where the narrative of, of history has been um, subverted or, or whatever you want to say. Um I thought maybe we could run down some some of the sort of more interesting or, or well, one of the first things I want to say, ask you is what, what one sort of stick out out of your whole uh, videography because you've got nearly a thousand videos now. I, I noticed. Good lord, how um, really? Yeah, nearly. It's nine hundred and something odd. Um, I wonder what one sort of stick out 
for you in your mind as sort of uh, maybe um, uh, flagship examples of, of, of what you're doing on your channel? Uh, 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 perhaps Cheddar Man, the Cheddar Man stuff, perhaps. Is there any, any ones like that that are sort of stick out in your mind? Yes, ones that YouTube have deleted oh, chiefly. Right. I often fall out with YouTube and they uh, delete my videos and suspend me for a while. So, yes. Um, Cheddar Man's a good example, so are uh, things like Beachy Head Lady and so on, because what's happened is that people look at skeletons, old skeletons, they examine the skulls and they say, oh, the proportions of this skull tell us that this was a black person. So as long as you're sticking to the narrative, that's perfectly OK. You can measure skulls, examine the proportions and so on. YouTube have a policy whereby if you suggest that black people's skulls were any different from white people, it counts as hate speech. So I had a video removed simply because I mentioned research that um, African, sub-Saharan African skull volumes tend to be slightly lower than white people's, uh, white European skulls, which is probably true, but I mean, there's some controversy over it. And I was banned instantly by YouTube for three weeks because they said it counted as hate speech. So that's that's something that sticks in my mind, because if I were to be claiming that a skeleton found from thousands of years ago was a black person, and we could tell this by measuring the skull, YouTube wouldn't ban that. Right. But if I talk about it in a different context, it suddenly becomes hate speech. Mm. Mm. It's crazy times, isn't it, with it, that, that sort of... Uh, censorship, double-edged sword. It's, it's you know different rules for different people. That's I mean, right. Um, yeah, it's complete, completely unfair. I mean, like Piltdown, Piltdown Man's another example, isn't it? You've talked about that. Um, <laughs> uh, how Cheddar Man's sort of a slightly newer version. Uh, but yeah, just the liar. You're just being lied to. Um, yeah. And and if you point out the liar, you're in trouble for pointing out the liar. That's um, perfectly correct. Um, it's just, it's it's just simply not fair, is it? I mean, I am surprised. Um, that uh, uh, that you haven't got in more trouble actually with YouTube. You must have heard that before. People must have said that to you before. That the that, that we're pleasantly surprised you're sort of still around on the platform. You know, there are some people that complain about literally every video, and they boast about this on Twitter. There are, are some people, there's a group of half a dozen people, they tune in every day and look at every video, and they complain to YouTube and accuse every video of being hate speech. So sooner or later, that sort of scattershot approach will obviously score some hits. Mm. Mm. It's what it's worrying, isn't it? Where there's people, it's their whole, it becomes their life just to rip someone else down without good reason even. I mean. Well, it's peculiar because, I mean, you know yourself, if you scroll through YouTube, there's an awful lot of stuff you don't want to watch. But I don't understand, me, I just switch to another channel or watch something else. <laughs> I don't really understand why people go to the same channel two or three times a day to watch things that they know they're going to be offended by. Yeah, yeah, that's a, an odd pathology, which yeah, I don't understand. I, yeah, I don't share. Um, yeah, and uh, the hate speech thing is obviously just getting worse. I mean, on, on, on my channel, my much smaller channel, History Bro, <laughs> I had a, a video, I got a warning and it was struck down for hate speech. There was no speech in it. There was no speech. <laughs> it was archive footage from World War Two and uh, a song. There was no dialogue at all. But it was, yeah, uh, yeah I got a warning and uh, it, the video removed. And uh, yeah, for hate speech. Yeah. I mean, it's... it's uh... YouTube are very hot on certain mm, things. Mm. To an extent, you can understand their concern because with the new online harms bill, which is going to be coming, you know, being passed by Parliament this year, there's going to be a lot of pressure on platforms like that. They will be held personally responsible for unpleasant views or dangerous views or offensive views. And I think they're trying to show that they can clean up their act you know, without the need for the new law. Mm. Well, of course, uh, offensive views could mean anything, couldn't it, really? It could indeed. Um, do you think, is it, am I going too far? Am I being guilty of hyperbole here to say that we're on a slippery slope to sort of Maoist era levels of censorship uh, is, is that craziness or not to you it doesn't seem like craziness to me the penalties are less i mean we're not going to be shot or shipped off the concentration camps for our views but there certainly are penalties people can lose their jobs they can have their careers blighted they can be you know, you know, assaulted in the street if people recognize them think about david starkey for a moment he made one unguarded comment 
And he's become a non-person now. You won't see him on the television. No one publishes books. Mm, it's worrying. He has got his, his own YouTube channel, though. <laughs> he has got his own YouTube channel. Yes, that's true. <laughs> Which is only half as popular as yours, it seems, at the moment. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm a big fan. And, yeah, you can get cancelled for, I say cancelled. But, yeah, you can get in trouble, let's say, for uh, such minor infringements. Um, yeah, uh, but where, where I asked about sort of Maoist era China or the idea that when you're on a slippery slope of censorship that you end up where there's only sort of 12 plays allowed, for example, or, or, or you know, there's only a certain type of certain number of haircuts you're allowed to have, you know, the things that to us seem insane. Um, but do, do you not think if we continue on this path, if there's not um, sort of widespread societal pushback on some level that the the cancellers <laughs> will, it, it, you know, it's the inevitable consequence of, of where it leads to is something like just a, a very small number of movies are allowed, that sort of thing. Sure. It's moving in that direction and then it will move back again. These things work like pendular, really. At one time it was impossible to put print certain words. I won't... Uh, say the words live on air, obviously, <laughs> what they used to call the Anglo-Saxon words or four-letter words, <laughs> and it was impossible to print them or say them on the television. Now you hear them all the time. It's nothing at all. That, that's one part of prudishness that's gone. But while those words were taboo, other words, racial slurs, as they're now called, could be thrown about freely and nobody minded them at all. But now they're printed with asterisks instead. Do you mm, see? Mm. So I think times change. And to, yes, at the moment, it looks as though we're heading in a certain direction in censorship, but that will change. And then another area will become the one that's forbidden. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, well, I've, I very much hope so that there's a sort of a redressing of it or the, the elasticity of, of censorship, however you want to say it, will we'll bounce back a bit. Um, yeah, well, fingers crossed that that happens and we don't just, you know, go down and down and down further until there's sort of no way back. Um, yeah, uh, I hope that's really not the case. Um, uh, one thing I wanted to ask you is um, about your, if you've got much or any real interest in the ancient world, um, because you do mention it from time to time, you know, references here and there, um, but it doesn't seem well, to be yes. sort of, uh, uh, yeah. it doesn't sort of seem to be one of the sort of mainstays of your interest, but uh, it, it's just my... Uh, favourite <laughs> is the ancient world. And I just wondered if there was anything particularly from the ancient world that you you, you think sort of pertinent or, or um, you know, useful for us today um, or anything along those lines, just anything that sort of... I, yeah, I do have interest. a great interest. Uh, you obviously haven't seen life in Roman London, which is available in most London museums. I'm currently working on a book called Exploring Roman London, oh, which will come out okay. this year as well. Oh, so, great. yes, I'm very interested in Roman history, particularly as it um, relates to Britain. I suppose one message there is that at that time, and during the Roman occupation, a lot of British slaves were exported from this country. British were slaves. And that's something which we tend to forget, that all nations have been slaves slavery wasn't an exclusively black experience and i find that so looking at the ancient world you can see slavery of all sorts white slaves black slaves indian slaves chinese slaves so there's no sense of perspective there when people talk about slavery if anybody now says the slave trade you know immediately mm. they're talking about black people being taken across the atlantic mm. that's regarded as the slave trade mm. Mm. No, it's, it's, it's crazy, isn't it, that it's been reduced to that. Yeah. Uh, right. What was one of the big islands uh, in the Eastern Med that was just basically a massive slaving port? Um, uh, it might have been Crete. Did the Romans use Crete as uh, yeah, a Yeah, yes, yeah, they did. They, yes, so there, was there, it, there, was, they, well, there was a lot of slaving activity in the Eastern Mediterranean. That's perfectly true. It's, but it was all over North Africa, Eastern Mediterranean, the whole of the Roman world was full of slaves. Mm. In uh, Rome itself, about a third of the population were slaves. Mm. It was an enormous business there. Yeah. It was very high turnover as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's uh, it's, it's sort of ubiquitous almost in history, it seems. Like uh, I was reading uh, a few months ago now, but how uh, when the Normans 
came over, they sort of did away a fair bit with uh, Anglo-Saxon slavery, <laughs> basically. Right. The, uh, the Anglo-Saxons enslaved each other, or um, in a later period that the Vikings would come and abduct people from Ireland or Cornwall or Lancashire or wherever and go and sell them in uh, Constantinople or something, or, 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 well, yes. or North Africa. Yes, indeed. Bristol was uh, first founded for that purpose. Bristol used to be a slave trading port before the Norman Conquest. A lot of slaves were exported from Bristol and taken to Ireland. The city of Dublin was founded as a slave trade centre originally. You probably know this, Dublin and Waterford. And th that was nearly all English slaves being taken from Bristol, shipped to Dublin. And from there, yeah, they were taken to Constantinople and also to Africa as well, to North Africa. I heard a great line from, I can't quite remember who it was, but it was a great line saying that you could find yourself one day working in the fields in Ireland and the next minute abducted, and then you find yourself labouring for a sultan's palace yeah, <laughs> on the Dardanelles. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> surreal to think that, isn't it? And, of course, one other thing just to say about slavery in the most general sense, uh, I've said this before to somebody in a, in a, in a conversation, uh, but that... There's all different stripes of slavery as well, right? I mean, the, 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 famously in sort of the high classical Roman times, you could be emancipated, you could be a freedman, um, and freed, freedmen could go on to be fantastically rich and powerful, among the most powerful and rich people in the empire, potentially. Um, but of course, when you look at, say, um, the, 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 the slave-owning plantations of the South in the 18th, early 19th century in America, for example, it does seem, to be fair, it does seem like a, a relatively harsh version. There are certainly more lenient versions of slavery, uh, but Indeed. there have been ones that have been even worse, for example, like the uh, people used as slave, slave labour at Pinamunda. <laughs> Uh, yeah. uh, for example, is as bad or perhaps worse. Um, uh, so anyway, there's all different shades of grey of how bad it could be and, of course, spanning all of time up to today as well. There's modern-day slavery, lots of it, terrible amounts of it, but it gets reduced to the slave trade. It's just the 18th century transatlantic thing. That's uh, right. It's just re reduced to, well, sort of a soundbite or not even that. Um, what, what do you think is going on there in sort of the popular consciousness? There's people like you or I who, you know, uh, uh, historically literate. And so it's not, we're not hoodwinked or fooled by this kind of thing. Um, but I mean, what do, what do you think, what are your feelings in general about how that could be redressed or how, how the 18th, 19th century transatlantic slave trade how slavery can be widened out so we appreciate that there's more than just that happened. I don't think it can be because it's in the influence of the United States. A lot of our ideas, things like political correctness, critical race theory, views on slavery have been imported from America. Just as, I mean, we, we import a lot of our music, our ideas on music. It's what they used to call coca colonialism. We take ideas wholesale from America. And since they're infected with this virus, and it's based on the fact that a sixth of their population are descendants of slaves, the whole idea has been brought here and applied to us as well. So until American society changes, until the perspective of American uh, African-American daughters, I guess we're rather stuck with that view. Really, that's that's worrying, isn't it? That's that's. Uh, I'm not saying you're wrong at all, but that's that's a terribly pessimistic view, isn't it? I mean, I, in fact, I, I agree. I think you're probably right. But what a worry that is. I mean, uh, because if anything, it seems like the winds, and this is just a perception. It's not necessarily objective truth, but it feels like uh, we're very, very far from it uh, being reversed or even slowed down. Um, so I think you're right. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a worrying thing. I mean, so if we take some examples, um, like uh, well, Mary Seacole, I mean, I know it's yeah. a bit obvious, perhaps, a bit, bit played yeah. out, she gets mentioned a lot. But, I mean, that's one sort of classic example, isn't it? Almost a perfect example of how history has been uh, warped or, 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 or the facts of what really happened. The, the truth yeah. has been lost. Um, uh, maybe if you could just say a word or two about Mary Seacole. Yeah, she was um, an America, a restaurant owner who uh, moved from Central America. She came to Britain because she had some investments in a gold mine in Central America. She wanted to see it floated on the stock exchange. So in the 1850s, she travelled to London 
because she wanted to deal with the London Stock Exchange and see this gold mine floated. Uh, it wasn't really very successful. She'd already owned a restaurant in Central America. She decided that it would be a good idea to open one for officers in the Crimean Peninsula you know, at the time of the Crimean War. So she went to the Crimea, opened a restaurant for officers. No, no ordinary soldiers, ordinary ranking soldiers were ever allowed in there. From time to time, she used to go out with, um, selling food and drink to spectators at battlefields. I know it seems odd to us, but battles in the 18th to 19th centuries were spectator sports. Mm -hmm. On a hill near a battlefield, you'd get a lot of people with parasols watching it. Until mm -hmm. It was an entertainment. She used to sell them. Um, drinks to those people and occasionally if she came across a wounded soldier she would give them a drink for nothing and apply rudimentary first aid right so not quite the narrative of uh sort of uh florence nightingale style oh no not a bit of it no, <laughs> right. no of course not <laughs> and it's funny i must admit i don't i don't uh really care if this makes me look ignorant but the fact is i'd hardly ever heard that name before i don't know four or five years ago um, no, of course. Uh, and suddenly you're supposed to, she was always a great figure in history. Uh, you know, sometimes yeah. how this happens in our modern culture is that something new comes up and they just expect you to accept that it's always been the case. Uh, just yeah. one tiny, tiny example of it is, um, you know, when, when COVID started, people started using the word uh, comor comorbidity. You know, to have multiple. Oh, yeah. uh, I'd yeah. never heard that word before, and suddenly everyone's not. using yeah. it. <laughs> you know, uh, and it's we've always used to use that word. That's a common word. <laughs> no, yeah. no, it's not. Come on. Yes, and people don't like to admit they've never heard it in right. case it makes them sound ill-educated. Mm. So we we all latch onto it and start using it as well. That's absolutely right. And it's the same with the Windrush thing. I had heard of Windrush before Brexit. I think maybe once or twice ever in the most passing reference in something or other ever had I ever heard. I, ha I was aware of this ship, the Windrush. But again, in like 35 years on this earth, <laughs> I'd heard it in passing reference a couple of times ever. And suddenly, it, literally within a week or two on the news, the narrative was everyone's supposed to know this is a rich part of our a history and, and, yeah. and heritage, and that's just a fact. It's always been that way. Isn't that, that's, that's kind of, that's insane. That's sort of evil. That's like Stalinist levels of rewriting the past, right? It I mean, it's, oh, sorry, yeah. No, 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 you're absolutely right. That's precisely what it is. But, I mean, that, that's, it's not the first, this isn't a new phenomenon. We, we all go, you know, this sort of thing's happened before in the past. People come up with a new idea, and rather than say this is a new and wacky idea, they try to pretend it's an old idea and try and say, well, of course, it's been around for ages. What? You haven't heard of that? And we, it's human nature. It's, oh, yeah, of course, I've heard of it, really. And you look around and you rush off and look it up in the dictionary or try and find out about it. Mm. Mm. That's a shame, isn't it? Um, the, the, you're quite right. Most people don't have, I don't know if it's the confidence or something, just to say, no, wait. <laughs> No, I've never heard of that. Uh, don't be silly. We ne no one ever used to talk about that. Uh, because, yeah, well, I suppose it's easier, isn't it, just to keep your head down and then look it up on, on your own on the sly and pretend that's you've always known. <laughs> I've never heard of the expression comorbidity. I've never right. heard it in my life. And oh, you're great. right. Suddenly in 2020, it zoomed up and everyone's throwing it around as though it's the most common word in the world. <laughs> It's mad, isn't it? Uh, but the one thing that sort of strikes me is that it, be it seems more and more brazen, though. Um, even in my even in my sort of adult life, uh, it, uh, it seems to be more brazen now. That there's no real uh, attempt at subterfuge or to trick people. It's just it's just out there. Take it or leave it. And and if you leave it, you're in the wrong. You're on the wrong side of history. That's very brazen, isn't it? It's very aggressive. Don't you think? It is. I agree. It is very aggressive, but. It's because people, you know, you said just now that people don't like to appear ignorant. One of the things that sort of I do that irritates people is no more than ask questions. Because if I haven't heard of something, I will say, well, I don't know. I, I mm. don't know anything about this. Can you tell me? Or why do you think this? Mm. Or I, I'm not sure. Can you explain to me what you mean by that? And that really winds people up because people don't like being asked questions. But to my mind, the most important thing in life is to ask questions. If I don't know about something, I ask, why do you say that? What do you mean by that? And that 
sometimes seems to infuriate people. Mm. Oh, well, those words could have come straight from the mouth of Socrates. So I, mean, <laughs> yes, I, I don't want to be yeah, too sycophantic, <laughs> but, but uh, that is sort of where he came that's from, true. wasn't it? And yes. people got very that's annoyed. True. Yes, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, absolutely right. I I couldn't agree more. I, I'm I'm not always exactly happy to, but I'm certainly not afraid to just say no. I don't I don't know that. You know, there's nothing wrong with not knowing something. There's nothing wrong no, with with ignorance in and of itself per se. I would have yeah. thought. Um, you know, no one can know everything. You know, <laughs> uh, yeah. but yeah, people are loathed, aren't they, to just admit that they've they've just know nothing about a certain thing. Yeah, they um, are. Yeah, I guess it's just uh, human nature. <laughs> um, um, uh, uh, one thing I wanted to ask you, just changing the topic back to sort of your videos ever so slightly, um, sure. is that you talked about um, horrible histories recently in a couple oh, yeah. of videos. Yeah. And uh, maybe this touches on something that's even even more sort of sinister than what we've been talking about before. And that's the, uh, talk about Socrates, uh, the corruption of the, 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 the mind of the youth. <laughs> yes. Uh, like very deliberate, seems to me. It is deliberate, yeah, yes. Yeah, I don't think there's any question. Uh, no. Whether it's deliberate or not, um, and the, well, just so people will know that horrible histories is a you know a, a kiddie show, books and TV shows, um, and here they're just peddling the narrative that uh, Britain has always been a multicultural society since ancient times, since the Roman yeah. era. Um, it's funny in Tacitus's uh, Agricola, there's no real mention of uh, any black men, but uh, there you go. Horrible history seems to be happy enough to rewrite the. The well, narrative. of course, the books, the books themselves didn't. When my daughter was small, she was a great fan of the horrible history books, and we had the complete set. I'm talking now about the late 1990s. The books themselves didn't do this. It's only since the BBC took over the franchise and started broadcasting it, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, no surprise. No surprise no, there. Not at all. Uh, I suppose maybe if we could, uh, if I could ask, it's just asking you to speculate here, but sure. what? could possibly be going through the minds of the senior executives and the senior producers and all the people that made it and greenlit it, what could their possible motivation be other than, and this is me guessing, just pure hatred for their own in-group? What? It seems madness. What do you think? Where are they coming from? What's their ultimate goal, do you think? Well, a lot of them want to be very with it and progressive and humane. And the best way of showing that you're with it and progressive and humane is to suck up the black people and to say that they are very important and that they've been hard done by and that history has neglected them. And it immediately it shows your own credentials. It shows that you're a right-thinking person. So you think it's just sort of virtue signaling and it's fashionable to, to virtue signal? It's just that? Yes, I think that's uh, most of it, yeah. You don't think, I mean, maybe this is me just... Uh going beyond what there's any obviously any evidence for, but that it's even more sinister than that, that people do, in fact, some of them, have a, a sort of hatred for, for Britain, uh, for whiteness. I mean, you can find people talking explicitly about whiteness. Uh, you know, there's a, a, a documentary recently, uh, Everything's Going to Be All White or something like that, where uh, I've only seen the trailer and it's got completely ratioed <laughs> all over the internet. But it's basically just, uh, you know, saying that there's something in and of itself about whiteness, which is wrong, wrong-headed, evil, inherently bad. Um, Again, that, it, yeah, that, that seems to come from a place of hatred, not just, not just virtue signaling. It doesn't come from a place of hatred. It comes from the United States. It's okay. part of the black power movement. You know, the black Muslims, it, uh, about the white devils, the idea of the black Muslims, and they were hugely influential in the late 60s, was that the original people, the sun people, were black people. And they created everything. They cre All civilization was created by black people. Ancient Egypt, Greece, Socrates was black. And that as a result of an experiment, a wicked scientist called Jacob created white people, white devils, and they're not really human. Oh, yeah. And they're the ice people <laughs> as opposed to the sun people. And they took over the world from the original people and claimed credit for all the things that the black people had done. So that's where this idea comes from. This is where the re revisionist history, which tries to insert black people everywhere, that's where it has its origins in the black Muslim movement. God, what a worry. I mean, I do so remember... we've some... imported that, the way we imported rock and roll in the 1950s and 
chewing gum and Coca-Cola in the 40s. So they gave us, yeah, Coca-Cola, blue jeans and critical race theory. Brilliant. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, it just is worrying. I mean, there's something you touched on there about, uh, I think it was from a, a really old Louis Theroux documentary where I, I heard the sort of some black supremacist, I think maybe Nation of Islam people in, in New York talk about that, where, you know, Winston Churchill was black and Abraham Lincoln was black and all that sort of thing. <laughs> uh, uh, but... You did touch on something about uh, the the ancient world uh, again there, um, and it comes up again and again when people talk about um, sort of the way history is a, a, a battleground for sort of baseness versus wokeism, <laughs> for want of a better expression. Uh, that there were that there were many black Roman legionaries, um, and uh, there is one account I can't remember who it's from, but I think there is one account uh, from maybe Cassius Dyer or some, someone like that, uh, where uh, up on the the, the uh, Hadrian's Wall, it might, might have been the, the Antonine Wall, there was one legionary there that was black. He was sub-Saharan black, but it was so rare, so unique, that it was completely worthy of note because it was like the oh, only yes, one, yeah. you know. Um, this is a man who frightened Severus. Because that's it, he was Severus. A notorious joker. Yes, he was described as Ethiop. That, that's quite true. There was one black man, and he was so out of the ordinary that he, he's come down into history. The other people who are sometimes claimed to the Arabian Moors uh, that were stationed at Hadrian's Wall, they were from uh, the Roman province of Mauritania, which is in modern day Morocco. They were Berbers, they weren't uh, black Africans at all. One of the tricks played in this uh, revising history is a linguistic one. Today, we talk about Africans and black as, as being virtually synonymous. If I said to somebody, oh, a lot of Africans have moved in next door to me, they instantly assume I'm talking about black people. It's as simple as that. So what people do now, they'll start talking about black history. And then when they move on and mention black soldiers or black Roman legionaries, everybody assumes that, oh, th these people were black Africans. They're not. It's like saying that uh, Severus is sometimes described as an African emperor. He was born in Cyrenica. His, uh, one of his parents was Italian, the other was Phoenician. He was white. We know this with his colour paintings of him. But if you describe him as African, you can then say, oh, he was an African emperor. And then it's easy enough to hint that he was really a black emperor. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that, that funny, uh, very deliberate misunderstanding between Berbers and Sub-Saharan people. Sure. Uh, yeah. So, for example, I've done a few videos about Hannibal of Carthage and about Carthage and things. And they were Phoenician. Sort of yeah. ethnically, That's fine. Um, and so they would have looked at, visually would have looked something like uh, uh, Zinazine Zidane, people from sort of Algeria. Sure. Um, so very definitely not sub-Saharan, um, no, and yet sure. people people get. I got a comment just the other day. It's like, how can you be so wrong? Of course they were they were black. All Carthage. Mm. It's like, oh, and people say the same about the Egyptians, don't they? Egyptian pharaohs, like the the the, the, the first dynasties, um, but fine. they were quite clear that. The Ethiopians further south were were separate to them. Of course they were, yes. Yeah. The ancient Egyptians weren't black at all. Mm -hmm. But in a lot of black history sites, you will see uh, the Carthaginians depicted as black. You'll see uh, Hannibal as a black person. It, <laughs> I don't know what you can do. One time, this was a crank history. This was sort of mad. This was like T. Lobb saying Rambo or something. This was absolute nonsense. And yet now it's become mainstream. Now it's on the BBC and it's mainstream mm. history. Mm. I wonder I wonder what you think about this. Who do they think they're kidding, really? Um, you know, because there's the average, I say it's going to be unfair to the average person, but there's the average person who might not be all that particularly historically literate and they just believe whatever they're told, whatever the last person told them, they'll just believe that as, as fact. So there's those people, um, the credulous, the gullible, whatever you want to say, it's not necessarily their fault. If they're not into, into history. They've got living their life in other ways, fine. But for everyone else, anyone who's sort of thinking, anyone that sort of knows it, it has any real grounding in history, they're not going to be fooled by any of this, are they? Uh, they don't need to be fooled. There you're talking about a tiny minority of people. Most people get their information about history at school or they get it from the internet. 
Very few people bother, unless you're particularly interested in history. Why would you look at books? In history, in history classes at school now, they don't use textbooks. There's no in secondary schools, there aren't textbooks anymore. Then the information isn't coming from books. So unless you, if you simply rely on the internet, if I were to uh, click now on Severus, and Google the name, I'm going to come up with all sorts of things, images of him as a black man, and stuff claiming he was black. And that's how people get their information, particularly very young people, you know, school children and teenagers. They're not going to go to the library and start reading up on uh, serious books, are they, about the Roman Empire? They'll take what they're given at school and what they see on the television. It doesn't mm. matter, essentially, to these people that the fact is that there's a small number of people that still read books and are interested in the topic, you can disregard those for practical purposes. Well, <laughs> it's so it, immoral, isn't it? It's so wrong to someone like you or I, hopefully, that, you know, uh, value the truth or at least the pursuit of the truth. It seems so, uh, I don't know, when you, when you see uh, historical dramas or something and, and, and the queen is depicted as a black woman or the, or uh, the, <laughs> the, 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 the Duke of York or something. There was a there was a Henry V they made recently, uh, not a few years ago, where one of I think it was one of Henry's brothers uh, was played by a black man. But there's there's loads and loads of examples of it, aren't there? They keep shoe shoehorning them in. Oh, Anne Boleyn. There was the Anne Boleyn thing recently. Anne Boleyn was black. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I I heard you touch upon it uh, on the New Culture Forum, but um, how does that? How does that help anyone, though? Really, I mean, they, they say things like, "Oh, I really need uh, as a, a person of color, I really need to see people that look like me on TV." How do, does that make any sense? Sure, that's, that's a non sequitur in my mind. How does that it doesn't make, make any, any sense? sense at all? Right. And obviously, the same. You then got to ask yourself this: Why doesn't the, that the lack of role models? adversely affect Gujarati Hindus and Chinese people living in this country. Right. If you look at A-level results, you'll find that Gujarati Hindus and Chinese are right up at the top and Africans and Caribbeans are right down at the bottom. So, I mean, not having Chinese role models or Indian role models doesn't make any difference to those people that are doing well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, yes. I mean, that's a great point. <laughs> it sort of highlights exactly... Uh, the issue. Um, there was something I wanted to ask you here about a sort of individual historians, uh, where we get a bit uh, sort of uh, uh, naming some names, because uh, that's one of the things uh, you're very good for. You seem relatively fearless just to name, just name names and say, look at this guy, look at this woman, and the nonsense they're, uh, they're peddling. I mean, there's uh, David Olasuga is one of them. You did a, a good one on uh, uh, Rennie Edo Lodge. Um, oh, she's priceless, yeah. <laughs> um, but there's lots of them, aren't there? Miranda Kaufman, there's, there's so many where they just write a book that is uh, just peddling outright falsehoods, really, uh, peddling a narrative which has got no bearing on reality, um, and yet it's, it's presented as a history book. They get um, good reviews in the serious newspapers. Yeah, the Sun Sunday Times will recommend them. The New Statesman says they're fantastic. So they don't really need they're, they're doing a damn sight better than I'm doing with my books. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure they make a decent profit. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, I mean, I wonder where at all, if any, something I hinted at earlier, where at all, if any point, uh, it can be effectively combated or if there can be any sort of pushback or any sort of counter culture or for want of a better expression in this way uh where they can be called out enough by people like you um or i don't know it just seems like there's there's sort of no hope and that's like one of the most dangerous things right when people feel like there's no hope um well what, what can fortunately, you do fortunately no 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 i mean fortunately i'm old i'm going to die before too long anyway so it won't really make any odds to me so from that perspective, I can be a little bit more relaxed about it. I'm probably not going to see the consequences, you know, the worst consequences of what's going on here. Mm. So that might also account for why I'm not as bothered. Yes, it's a <laughs> shocking situation, but um, it's, you know, it, it, it's, it'll be for the future to sort out. Mm. 
Mm. No, that's again very worrying, isn't it? Just to sort of uh, <laughs> leave it like that. But um, just uh, uh, I suppose just in that vein, um, we've talked a fair bit about Enoch Powell. Um, oh, yes. it, it's yeah. exactly that sort of vein, isn't it? That sort of what 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 future generations are really going to have to deal with. Um, and uh, I, I mean, you, you've talked about Powell a, a few times, and, oh. and and said that you know what he said. For a start, it was quoting someone else, and That's right, and, yeah. and that the overall point he was making was far from crazy or off the main beam at all. It was yeah, perfectly reasonable. You, you, yeah, you um, mentioned Renny Edo Lodge. Mm. In her book, she says that Powell said that in uh, twenty years the black man would have the whip hand over the white man, and she reads a lot into this and explains why he chose the expression whip hand. But of course, that's rubbish. Powell was quoting a constituent of his. She knows that, and she deliberately pretends it was Powell's expression that he had chosen. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, a lot of that goes on. With Enoch Powell, you're on fairly safe ground. Everybody despises him and detests him and thinks he was a racist. So you can tell whatever lies you want about him, really. Mm. What a tragedy! Anybody that, that defends can... him is going to be a white supremacist. So it's fine if you don't mind being denounced as a white supremacist. And it doesn't matter to me. I haven't got a job. I've got my books and my YouTube channel. I'm regularly denounced as being a white supremacist. But that, that's not a matter. It doesn't concern me. I would be uneasy if I were 30 or 40 because I might be looking at ruin and social disgrace if I were uh, outed as a white supremacist. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's really bad. It's sort of maybe where sort of battle lines are drawn in future generations, or just the next generation, or this That's one. Um, yeah. Um, no, it is worrying when you know the, the 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 way when you look back at what Enoch Powell, his life and career, what he actually said at that point, and the reaction to it at the time. Um, how, in some ways, it's very very similar to today in some ways, isn't it? Yeah. Very similar. He would even say, just as he's talking about mass immigration, reasonably, in my opinion, he would say, no, I know I'm going to get, <laughs> I'm going to get lombasted for this. I'm, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to have all kinds of enemies come after me and call me all sorts of terrible names. Uh, so very modern in that sense. Yeah. He sort of knew the game he was involved in. And it, there's a fair few interviews where people try and set him up for a fall, yep. you know, and he sees it coming. You know, he's an extremely intelligent man, wasn't he? A very, very young professor. Youngest and, uh, professor in the British Empire. At the right. age of 25, he was professor of Greek at, uh, in Australia. Right. And wasn't his, uh, and wasn't his uh, message at the time extremely popular with Hugely normal people? Popular. Hugely popular in 1968. I remember, the because I lived in the East End, uh, all the dockers came out in support of him. There were marches to Parliament. I mean, it was Ted Heath that sacked him from the shadow cabinet, mm. and he was ruined politically. He was a pariah after that speech. Mm. That's funny. Do you, you've got any thoughts about Ted Heath's thinking on that? Was it just simply here's a here's a, 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 a danger to my political career? Get rid of him, regardless of truth or what's right or anything. No, I, I personally, I, I think that Ted Heath was a fairly honest man, but I don't think he was a particularly brilliant one. And I, I think that he honestly believed that he was doing the right thing, but he was a very stubborn and not very bright man, which was a ruination of him when it came to 1974, you know, when he called the election to see uh -huh. who ruled the country and discovered it wasn't him. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, uh, it's a bit of an, an embarrassment for him there. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about, because you've mentioned a couple of times, uh, or a couple of times that I've seen, I haven't seen all your videos, although I have watched hundreds. Um, uh, you put out quite a few, don't you? Uh, the Natural History Museum, you mentioned from time to time here and there. Uh, again, yes. maybe often sort of around uh, 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 Cheddar Man, things like that. Um, mm. And I wondered... Because I'm a huge fan of the British Museum. I love the Natural History yeah. Museum as well, but the British Museum, I've, I've uh, been a friend of the British Museum a couple of different times in my, in my time. I go to a fair few of their exhibitions, all sorts of things like that. Um, one of my courses at uni was actually on the Greek and Roman collection there. And Anyway, I've, I feel quite a close personal affinity with the British Museum. Cool. Um, 
and as well as the National Trust and the British Library and all these sorts of institutions which seem to be, well, well they're essentially lost to the, the other side of the aisle, so to speak, the, the wokists, should we say, if you want a better right. expression. Um, uh, and you, you might, obviously you see that happening. And do you think that that is something that's reversible in any kind of a way? Because I'm worried that in the end, places like the Natural History Museum or the British Museum will be, again, I don't want to be too alarmist or over the top about it, but they'll be stripped out of most of the artefacts. And yeah. the ones that are left will have pl plaques just completely demonising us. Yeah, I'm sure that the collections will change, but then they always have done, haven't they? The collections and the way they're displayed have changed. The greater danger to me in place of the Natural History Museum is doing away with glass cases. You know, they prefer to have um, screens, electronic displays now. Mm. But there's a fear that uh, young people won't really be able to relate so much to just uh, exhibits in glass cases. So there's a, a desire to have things being fancy and new. Do you see? So, mm. yeah, mm. obviously the, the plaques and the information things will alter as time goes on. I mean, you wouldn't want them still to display Piltdown Man, would you? Because <laughs> at one time it was there, and then they realised that, that was, it was quite wrong and it was fraudulent, so they removed it. So I think the same process always happens in museums. It's not going the direction that I like at the moment, but then I might be wrong. It might. This is my personal view of matters. And as I say, because I'm old, it's, my personal view is distorted anyway. It may well not be the correct one. All right. Uh, well, f fair point. I mean, absolutely fair point. I mean, of course, uh, curators will always change and they'll change how things look in a museum. But I think, well, of course, there's the, the, the Elgin marbles or the Parthenon friezes. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and the, I suspect at some point the trustees of the British Museum and actually I think the, the government actually get saying it in some way. Eventually, they'll, they'll uh, capitulate and give those back to, to Greece. I suspect, but then that seems like the thin end of thin end of the wedge. Because if you say, look at the British Museum, um, most of it isn't Indigenous British artifacts. Most of it yeah. is from all over the world, uh, right. particularly the Egyptian, Greek, and Roman galleries. If we were yeah. to give it all back, there wouldn't be much left in that museum, <laughs> in a way. Um, <clears throat> it wouldn't still exist if we hadn't taken it. A lot of right. things like the Elgin marbles probably would have deteriorated or been smashed up or blown up by the Turks or something. Mm. It was simply because we brought those things to Britain and put them in a museum that they're still around. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. So we've really done a favour to the rest of the world. Yeah, the way Greece treats most of its uh, its archaeology that still just sits there on the ground is diabolical. <laughs> yeah. It's ridiculously bad. Yeah, that's right. So my, I don't know what your feeling is on the Elgin marbles, but mine is... Um, no, you can't. No, you shan't have them back. I'm afraid. <laughs> no, green um, You know, if you can come over, defeat our uh, navy, storm London, take them back from uh, our cold dead grip, then you can have them. Until then, <laughs> no deal. Uh, but that's just me. Maybe it's a very hard line. <laughs> but well, there are other things that were sort of. Um, uh, there are a, a few things, I suppose, in the British Museum that do seem like a tiny bit out of place um, that well, it doesn't see. Like, for example, um, they've got one of those Muai statues, you know, from Easter Island. Oh, Easter Island Hedge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's one of those That's there, great. isn't there? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I really I'm like it. I'm always impressed with that as a child, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you, you don't think we should send that back to Easter Island, I hope. Oh, no, go, no, 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 of course They've not. They've got loads there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're being greedy if they want that one back. Yeah. It's not even particularly big, I think, no, compared to some it. of them. Um, <laughs> um, but, yeah, I, I wonder if we can't have a different sort of, in the, in the grandest, most general sense here, um, a, a, a whole new type of narrative which is just more positive because it always seems to come back, our, our detractors, the other side of the aisle, however you want to say it, um, I hesitate to say leftists because it's more than that. I wouldn't say cultural Marxists even that because I know people that got no con con no idea, uh, no conception about Marxism at all, and yet they're completely on board with uh, um, running down Britain and our history and our heritage. Yeah, they're the possible. barbarians that have taken the citadel. Right. <laughs> yeah, very good way of putting it. Um, 
Uh, that we that, is it not possible that we could, there could be a, a more positive narrative around nearly all of it? I'm not saying lie or pretend or even by omission any of the things that uh, our history has, which is bad. Or you know, of course not. I wouldn't want to ever lie, even by omission. But the idea that it's omitted anything positive. Um, for example, for example, what I'm talking about here is uh, take slavery, the 18th, 19th century transatlantic slave trade. Um, well, going along with that is the story of abolitionism sure. and, and, and the abolitionists, um, yeah. you know, and, and Wilberforce and Pitt and Earl Grey and all those guys. Not very often spoken of. There isn't like an abolitionist week on Channel 4 no, or anything wrong. like that, is there, you know? Um, and I wonder if it, it could be the place of... Uh, people like you or I, people that just talk about history uh, and trying to be honest about things, um, that, that, they, that, that that side of things couldn't be stressed more. Is that a good idea or worth it doing? It would be a good idea if it could be done. If you could get enough people that didn't mind losing their careers, and enough people that didn't mind YouTube banning them, because that's what's likely to happen, because that is exactly what happened to David Starkey. He was being, someone was talking about black genocide, and he said, what do you mean genocide? It's ridiculous. If it had been genocide, there wouldn't be so many blacks, would there? You know, both in Africa and here. And that was it. That was the destruction of them. Mm, mm. And it's perfectly true. Of course, to use the term genocide is absurd in those circumstances. Mm. But it was just those few unguarded words that were the end of him. He was trying to do precisely what you're suggesting, and it didn't do him much good. Mm. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, maybe it just takes some sort of critical mass if enough people do it. I mean, maybe I'm just being pie in the sky, crazy, blue-eyed, <laughs> naive about it. <clears throat> but I just feel like the, if enough people talk the truth, it, it counts for something. Um, again, maybe I'm being childlike there. I don't know. Hopefully not. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like, for example, like... You, I, you, Occasionally you hear somebody, usually an American actually, but not always, but you hear somebody say that like the British Empire is sort of ground zero for slavery. It's like the ultimate, you know, it, it's the ultimate criminal um, sure. w uh, uh, when in fact, you know, like the abolitionist movement, all sorts of things you can point to that which, you know, cast doubt yeah. on that. Um, and I, I just feel like it could be extremely valuable and I, I would I would like to think you could make a video about the career of William Wilberforce without being deleted off of YouTube what do you think if you don't specifically talk about the nonsense of black genocide then um could you do a video you could do a video just about Wilberforce surely it's possible yes yes I might well do that huh. Okay, I wasn't. That wasn't a suggestion. I wasn't trying to <laughs> make you do anything like that. I mean, I, I would. I should. I should do a video on that. I mean, I have thought about it in the past. But it's quite a big topic. I don't just want to do like you know a twenty-minute video. I'd like to do for a few hours on it. Um, sure. Um, but yeah, no. Um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely right. Um, one thing, just to sort of uh, uh, start to draw it to a close, uh, sure. and I do again really appreciate your time, Simon. Um, is there's one thing in, uh, in, in Tacitus, in the annals of Tacitus, yeah. he talks a fair bit about censorship, what it means to live through a tyranny, a, a Domitian, Tacitus, the ancient Roman historian, lived through the tyranny and censorship of, of uh, Domitian. Um, and he talks about it, he survived it all, didn't he? And he came out on the other side just to talk about what, what it's like to have lived through that and to have kept quiet, to have kept your head down, and that he sort of beat himself up a bit about that, don't you think? No. Or he sort of didn't really ever yeah. forgive himself for not doing yeah. enough or not really doing anything at the time. And after the fact, once you're allowed to sort of say what you want in the age of Trajan and Hadrian and things, um, it's all very well and good to say what a terrible thing happened, but, but he didn't do anything at the time. Um, and, 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 the, and, and the way he talks about it is sometimes very... Uh, emotional or evocative or something. And it seems very more and more prescient um, to me. And, uh, and I just wondered if there are things we can learn there and whether you would encourage people to sort of start standing up more and using their voice more or whether you do think that's kind of pointless or, or what you think is kind of the best, the best way forward for us here. I mean, much beyond 
our lifetimes even? What, what is the By best asking way? Asking questions. Right. Well, because an awful lot of what passes for modern history is what we call bare assertion. It is people asserting that such and such a thing is so and leaving it, and you're expected to take someone's word for it. But that's ridiculous. I hope nobody would dream of taking my word for anything. I, I would be really disturbed if people felt that what I was saying were absolutely correct at all times. Of course it's not. I make mistakes. I make errors. Everybody does. So if I can encourage anybody to do anything, it would be to ask questions, to ask, why do you think that? What is that belief grounded in? Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's one of the, I think, probably the most important single thing I got from sort of the formal study of, of history, mm -hmm. or in my case, classical, classic history, uh, is who is the historian saying this? Who are they? What's their motivations? Or what oh. might their motivations be? Yeah. And it seems like kind of day one, simple stuff. Obviously, you're going to do that. But it, it's not really that obvious. People don't seem to question quite often. They'll read something, or like I say, even right now today, they'll read some random article, some random website you've never heard of, and just accept everything that's in it uh, without yeah. looking at the, you know what the website's about or who the actual author is or what yeah, motivations yeah. they might have. Yeah. Um, and yeah, if, if, I suppose if we could just spread that, if nothing else, <laughs> to be uh, questioning or sceptical about all sources. Um, yes. Doesn't I seem agree. like too much to ask, but I guess it is actually quite. No. It is quite it's an unusual. ask, though. Yes. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, so Simon, have you got anything else? Are you allowed to tell us what you've got coming up on your channel, or do you keep, sort of keep that under your hat, or uh, <laughs> is it sort of a day-to-day -day thing for you? No, I've got a broad scheme. No, I, I, it's a matter of deciding how far I can, what I can say, without getting completely banned, because. I don't want YouTube to close me down entirely. Mm. So there are some things that I have to steer clear of. Mm. Anthropometry, measurement of skulls I can't talk about. Right. I can't really discuss IQ levels because there's a lot of research about that as well. And I'm not saying that the research is correct. Some of it is faulty. There's named people like Richard Lynn. There's various uh, people that I would like to talk about, and I can't. So, no, I, I have to... Uh, steer as close to the wind as I'm able. <laughs> yeah, no, well, you've, you've been doing a very good job. And uh, yeah, I do uh, well, I do appreciate all your work. A, lo a lot of us do. So um, yeah, no, thanks again for your time and, and, and uh, keep it up. I shall be uh, watching the videos. And um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I really appreciate all that you've done. Well, it's been nice speaking to you. No, thank you. Okay, Simon. then. Cheerio. All right. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye. You too. Bye.